immigration reform. Uh, day before yesterday, had a chance to go visit with five young people that were fasting over at St. Monica's Catholic Church. And uh, very moving, uh, very wonderful testimony these young people gave and had a chance to sit and chat with them. They invited me to come to Mass uh, the next day, uh, Sunday, because they were fin ending their fast and they were having a celebratory Mass. Uh, I invited my family, they were a little bit in shock, but we went to Mass. And, uh, and the ch church was packed, outside, inside. And, uh, and what, what these young people were asking for is a very simple democratic tradition was to say, let members of Congress vote on something. Let's move this agenda forward sitting here in this very terrible limbo on the question of immigration reform is doing no, no good for this country, and that they demand a vote, that a vote be taken and let the American people make its judgments as to how a person votes and doesn't vote as opposed to holding hostage, I think, one of the most important economic issues that we're facing and holding hostage, I think, the future of the social fabric of this nation itself. By not doing anything, we are aggravating and making the situation worse. Avoiding a vote is not going to politically help anybody. It might politically give some cover for a while. But at the end of the day, when fingers are pointed historically, it is those that walked away from the vote that will bear the burden for doing nothing and aggravating a situation that should be dealt with. Uh, Vice President Biden probably said, I love the Vice President, he says everything, you know, I love it. And, uh, and, uh, but he said something, he went to visit the fasters that are in Washington, D.C. And uh, he said something very poignant and very profound. He said to them, the 11 million people in the shadows are already Americans because America is an idea and they have already become part of that idea. I thought that, and that's, you know, if we look at the humanity of this issue, that's it. And the, the summary for me is real simple. Uh, if we want to move forward, we have to reject the fear and the pandering, the political pandering that occurs on this issue. And we have to, you know, step away from the baseless untruths that are, taught, that are said about immigration and look at the real reality. We have to accept that this is a reality. It will not disappear because we, somebody is in denial. It is a reality. It's a reality that our country needs to deal with. And uh, it will, if we, all of us, care as much as we care about this country, then its economic security and its social security depend on moving a comprehensive package of legislation with a path to legalization down the road so we begin to tend to this very, very important issue. Uh, you know, I'm not terribly excited about the Senate bill. I'm not, you know, the House version is facsimile thereof. You know, it's, it, it's over-reliance on militarization on the border. You know, 20,000 extra border patrol agents, 43 billion on top of 19 billion. And uh, no economic development agenda in that package that deals with trade, import, export, job creation. Uh, no humanitarian response to the 5,000 people that have died in that desert. And uh, transparency and checks and balances so that the American people know how their money is being spent, number one. And number two, the checks and balances so that there is uniform policies on use of force, uniform policies that citizens and residents and others can have a chance that it's going to be adjudicated and at some point there will be an answer to that grievance. Those are things that are not part of it. But as somebody much smarter than I said, you know, if the opportunity is in front of me, I will take that opportunity because I, I would rather work to correct the flaws and deficiencies I see in this legislation than to sacrifice progress on some altar of perfection which is, in our system, is not going to be perfect. And uh, so that's, 
I am, remain hopeful and optimistic about immigration reform moving forward. I, I say that because the latest polling says 63% of the American people want comprehensive immigration reform with a path to legalization. 47% of those individuals are Republican. 61% are independents, 73% are Democrat. Voters across this country are telling Congress this is an issue we want dealt with. And, and, uh, and that's the kind of momentum that I think is important for us to remember. We're on the right side of history, and the people that are delaying a decision are on the wrong side of history. Uh, Affordable Care Act. The rollout was a debacle. As Democrats, it's not about accepting responsibility, it is about understanding and accepting the fact that it was a debacle. And that, that accountability has to come down the road. The president as president has assumed responsibility for that start. And you know, I, I, I for one can defend the substance of that act day and night and debate it with anybody. I can't defend the program. <laughs> I can't defend what happened to the website. And unfortunately, the opposition, primarily Republican, and the private insurance companies now have got, now have got something that they can use to bludgeon the CARE Act over and over again. But, you know, this is not a revelation. And, you know, the president says by the 30th of November, we should be up and running. Additional opportunities being afforded people to be able to get access and get in there. And when you have a state like Arizona that has 214,000 children without insurance, when you have one of the highest rates of uninsured in the state, and particularly aggrieved in the rural and, uh, and low-income urban areas of this state of ours, it behooves us health providers that the Affordable Care Act work. And... Uh, I find it really, you know, this epiphany that, uh, that Republicans are having, all we want to do is help you. <laughs> the insurance companies, we just want to make it work well for the American people. This Congress, House of Representatives voted 43 times to defund it. It is uh, 17 days of a government shutdown that cost us $24 billion never to be retrieved in revenue, that 120,000 people lost their job and are barely coming back onto their jobs in the private sector based on that shutdown, and uh, the default crisis, staring the, the, the credit of the United States, risking collapsing our credit internationally to defund health care and to and shut 17 days of shutdown to defund. And Baynard said the other day, what we're doing with the Upton bill, which passed the other day in the House, is that what we're doing, this is one of our targeted strikes. Because the end result has to be, is to topple, quote unquote, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so, so my suggestion, and I was asked by the media, same thing, before we stampede into a panic, before we run away from the Affordable Care Act, either out of political or personal prerogatives, let's understand that the health care plan is an opportunity to provide a quality of life for the American people that has never been available before. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I found it really interesting statistics. They don't, they don't get into detail, and I'll finish with that. 53% of the American people don't like the Affordable Care Act. 19% of them don't like it because they don't think it goes far enough. <laughs> they, those are our single payers. Those are lowering the age of Medicare. And those are the public option Americans that are out there. And because uh, it didn't go far enough. And, you know, eventually, you know, uh, as anything, as Social Security, as Medicare, uh, in our democracies, there's an evolution. 
and that evolution will happen. And healthcare as we know it now will be very, very different 10, 15 years from now. And the American people will love it like they love their Medicare and like they love their Social Security. And that's the way it should be. Uh, well, the other side effect, the last since the CARE Act was uh, passed, there have been subs the, the lowest rate, like 3% versus 18, 20, 30 in the past, of premium, private insurance premium increases for all, for all participants. Uh, interesting. I, and uh, the budget. December 13th, we're supposed to get a product, and what those budget negotiations are, Senate House. Uh, we're looking at uh, Progressive Caucus speaking in their behalf and, and a lot of other Democrats. We're looking for an investment strategy to be part of that. We're looking for revenue generation uh, outside, uh, continuing to decimate every program that the American people depend on, including education and support services across this country. Uh, we're, one, we're looking at a rollback on the automatic tax cuts that are, that are in place right now. And uh, we're looking for investments, early childhood education, and uh, looking at the farm bill as that compromise works out so that we don't, in order to save some subsidy, end up cutting $40 billion away from people that, are, that, can't, that need the food, need the nutrition, and, and, and that has historically been the compromise. Many of us would turn a little bit of a blind eye on some of the subsidy on some of the farm because poor people in this country are being taken care of with regard to the nutrition. That equation is now shifted and that is going to be a very critical bill about what the future holds for us. Budget, immigration, and the Affordable Care Act. I want to talk about three quick issues and open for questions. Issues that are of national import but also translate very much to issues here in southern Arizona and in the state. The environment. There has been a consistent assault on the regulatory and historic laws that have been in place since the 60s and 70s. Clean Water Act, NEPA, the public process part of it, uh, environmental analysis, uh, Antiquities Act, Native American protections around grave sites and sacred sites, and the list goes on and on. The mantra has been, these regulations and laws are in the way, we need to create jobs. And our public lands have now become the only multi, there is no multi-use anymore. There is extraction is the only use that we have for those public lands. And I, I mentioned that, let's look at the local scenario. Those laws are in place to provide accountability and those laws are in place to give the American people a chance to look at all consequences of any decision, any land trade, or any permitting process for extraction. All consequences, intended or not. And so you have Rosemont. Done a wonderful job of uh, ingratiating themselves in this community. And buying some organizations, <coughs> buying some friends, uh, the, they're 0 for 17, my latest count, of every, every candidate they supported for public office is lost. Uh, and an EPA came out with their decision, which puts it squarely on the permitting process in the Forest Service, and that's a consequence. That's why we have these laws in place, so you will know, and I will know, and decision makers will know what the consequence to a community, to a region, and to an area will be long term. And uh, so, Resolution Copper, up in, in, in the Copper Triangle Superior, that area, they've been wanting this mine for ever, 10 years since I got there. But how they want the land trade is give us the land first and then we'll do the studies. 
then it's private property, so I don't care what they find there. Yeah. There's not a thing we can do to mitigate or remediate whatever was found. Uh, they, they put it on the floor twice and they had to pull it because they don't have the votes. Good. And, and I, a group that we should all thank is Indian country. Native Americans in unanimity have opposed this because they see it as a precedent and violation of sovereignty and violation of sacred sites, cultural resources, and the protections afforded to them under the Constitution and by law. And, and, uh, and I really believe that resolution will rear its head again, Rosemont will rear its head again, but what's on our side now is ammunition. We have studies, we have decisions now being made by other agencies. And so I don't know what Rosemont's future is going to be, uh, but it is, uh, in my mind, it's, you know, that fight is not over. But for once, I kind of feel that like we're in equal ground now in this, in this thing, which we weren't before. before. And uh, they're gonna have to buy a whole much more organizations in the next three months, but uh, <laughs> God bless them, it hasn't worked so far. Uh, education. Education at the public side, in, in the federal government, there's been a de-emphasizing and handing over everything over to the state, which, for, which is kind of scary for a place like Arizona. Uh, and for any state, that there's, if we really believe in local control, let's deal directly with those communities uh, and those entities that are responsible for education. Higher Education Reauthorization Act is a very important to, to our higher ed institutions. And, uh, and the automatic cuts that would hit education would be devastating this time around. There is nothing a school district could do to recover other than to go ask for an override and those are difficult if not impossible to get. And, uh, you know, and part of the education is the defunding. Also this kind of market-driven philosophy that education should, you know, be competitive, and it should. it should. It should be accountable and competitive. But that shouldn't be the driving philosophy on how we run our schools. And uh, let me give you interesting little statistics. Uh, and the big, there'll be the big push for more and more charter and more and more voucher. That'll be the federal push. You know, California has, let me give you an example, this is why in Arizona, California has 1,067 charter schools. They have 314 authorizers. Those are the people that oversee it, certify it, da 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 da. And they have a robust staff of 30 or 40 people. Uh, Arizona has 561 charter schools, which is a little more than half of what California has, and given the fact California has a few more people, uh, it's kind of seven authorizers with complete authority and power, and, and a minuscule staff of two or three to look at oversight, to look at how money's being spent. And you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we should tear down the charter schools and call it a day or that we should get rid of for-profit colleges and call it a day. But if we are asking the public sector to play by a set of rules and a set of conditions and a set of expectations and a set of accountabilities, then I think what, what's good for this goose has to be good for that gander. Yeah, yeah. And, and right now it's not played that way. <laughs> for-profit schools, take in $32 million, billion dollars of federal aid. 7.5 million in Pell Grants, student guaranteed federal loans, and there may be 11, 12% of the higher ed population, maybe eight, yet they're bringing in 30 to 40% of the federal dollar is going to those for-profit institutions. We are saying you gotta play by some rules, it's gotta be some accountability. Uh, Employment, where do your graduates end up? What is your debt level? How many are online? How many are in a classroom? And you, if you, are, you must get at least 15% of your operating capital from the private sector. 
Right now it's a 90-10 equation and it goes exactly 90-10 if not less. And because they are proprietary, it is one heck of a thing trying to get information from them on how they're spending the money. We know that a third of that money, no, 22% of that money goes to recruitment and advertising. And because they are a private sector, there is stockholder prerogatives and shareholder profit lines that must be maintained. All we want in that issue for us is an issue of fairness, that we do not at a time when our, the face of this nation of ours is changing. Nothing to fear, it's changed before, and it's changing. When one out of three babies going to kindergarten in this state are of color, that demographic change is not something to be ignored, defunded, put aside. This is the time you invest in that ba those babies. So those babies can be taking care of me when that time comes, just as we return the favor to the generation that preceded us. And, and this is no time. Filibuster, good thing happened. Uh, and why, somebody asked me why. In, in, in all of the history of the presidencies of this great nation of ours, 86 appointments by a president from all, were, of all the presidents besides Obama were blocked by filibuster. President Obama, in his tenure, 82 have been blocked. Now, you kind of reached the point that there is no more point to go to. And I hope that creates some freedom for, for, for the Senate to pass things like that have been held up, minimum wage, equity pay, uh, anti-discrimination, uh, and a budget that is more investment oriented than cut oriented and revenue generating from those that have benefited most from the last 10 years of a fiscal policy that has made them horribly, horribly well off at the expense of the middle class and those and people on a fixed income are poor. That's the balance we want. And we also want, uh, and it puts a lot of pressure on the House of Representatives. The leadership there has been getting away with murder. They don't have to deal with any of these issues. Now they come back to us. And then the voters in this next year will have a real, real opportunity to gauge and hold accountable their member in the House of Representatives for what he or she votes on or doesn't vote on. I, I think that's the accountability that we get every two years, and we shouldn't be able to get away without having to take some votes. And so far, they've had it their way. If we get some of our issues on there, then it's a whole different story.